And this is episode 42. Be funnier than Weird Al Dada on the Do It All Dad Year podcast. Dad friendly entertainment for you and me. Controlling your kids through comedy can make our kids great again. And that was my son, Arthur Morrison Cornbluth, doing that phenomenal, hilarious intro that was inspired and created in his honor. So we definitely can't call an episode Be Funnier Than Weird Al Dada Without Delivering the Laughs. Because like Joe Rogan says, the great Joe Rogan, funny is funny means generating ha 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 laughter. Not his exact words, but that's what he meant. Funny equals money. That'd be nice in my case. So like I'm telling my kids, I'm tired of uh, just talking about it. I'd like to start producing the guilt sometime this millennium. So let's get to some jokes, people, so I can impress my new connection on LinkedIn, who uh, was a an executive producer on The Daily Show. I should know her name right now, but it doesn't make a difference. So uh, let's get to some jokes, people. This is my seven-year-old daughter describing her A&W root beer float in Lake George, New York. The root beer tastes like alcoholic medicine. My seven-year-old daughter, as my divorce pusher... <laughs> You and mommy are a bad couple. You fight all the time. You don't even have plans for Valentine's Day together. (laughs) Mommy, pick a superhero to play. Mommy says, all right, I'm a super squirrel. I ask, what's your superpower? Chipping away at dad's nutsack? One passive aggressive snip at a time. Every mom, I read this while looking up some uh, writer quotes today. Every mom has a moment in the day when they hate their children. But I thought women were the never lazy, never self-involved ones. Fake feminists. Not once have I ever hated my three kids. Sucks to have selfish, boring twats as your mom's kids. Sorry. (laughs) This is my mom. This is my uh, elitist retired mom. Tomorrow, we're going to the Johnny Cash Museum. This is the unemployed comedian slash father three being me. Shel Silverstein wrote a boy named Sue. Mom says, who? My reply, exactly. Want to be deep, fake news, banker, hippie. Hey now. Just write on Twitter that the uh, Village Voice is officially uh, ending its uh, run as the, uh, what, the leading alternative uh, newspaper. In, in America. So this is my response to it because I used to do ad sales for the Village Voice that paid like 32 k This is uh, the Obama economy. I'm not going to blame everything on Obama. Uh, w didn't do that economy any favors, neither did 9-11. But I couldn't find anything and this was ages ago. So I ended up selling print ads for the Village Voice. I sold some sponsorships, but I'm not going to get into my freaking resume over here. Like, what, what am I interviewing with uh, s- some HR lady? But this was the typical ad sales obstacle when I sold print ads for the Village Voice. Do trannies still advertise in the back? Yes, but now they're only stamp size. Sorry if the bottom is your favorite part. <laughs> I've said it before here, folks, but I don't buy the fact that Bruce Jenner was asexual when married to Chris Jenner. But I know for a fact that Bruce Jenner definitely stayed harder longer after he convinced Chris to cut her hair short so she could look more like a dolled up Ralph Macchio. My kids absorbing my rapidly declining attraction to mama. Didn't you wear that outfit yesterday? I didn't know you had leg fat, mama. And get in the lake already. Mama, the more you cover up, the better. (laughs) Meaner equals funnier. Sorry, folks. That's just the way it is. HR. This is HR. This is a mock interview with HR because I'm not rocking many interviews with HR these days. HR. On LinkedIn, it says your title is Do It All Dad Year Podcast Host. Do you get political on your podcasts? What would you call yourself? 
unemployed comedian slash father of three replies, I'm a bulls conservationist. <laughs> so uh, Joe uh, Grobato Biden uh, was uh, was trending on uh, on Twitter this week. He gave a, uh, a touching eulogy in honor of uh, McCain. Like Michael Savage says, you got to separate the uh, the warrior from the statesman. I, I do agree with that. Nonetheless, uh, this is my comment about Joe Grobato Biden. You could YouTube the videos. These videos weren't made up. Uh, there was no, uh, you know, cutting and pasting or, or fudging. There's a series of videos where you see Joe Biden touching kids for extended periods of time, making them all excessively uncomfortable. And there's actually one part where you see Joe Biden going to hug one of Jeff Sessions' uh, grandchildren, and Sessions slaps his hand away with, like, immediate disgust. So you be the judge for what that means. But here we go. And I do have an affection for Joe Biden from, for the sole reason that my wife, uh, I can't mention her name, uh, I don't really think that this is going to incriminate her at this point, but back in the day, uh, she, listen, we all make mistakes, she was convicted of shoplifting, and as a result, she was actually forced to stay in Australia, and she was not allowed back in the country in America. She was born in Brisbane in Australia. Then her parents moved to Victoria. At 10, she moved to Delaware. Uh, her father's an SAP consultant. And she was in Australia on a trip. And she wasn't allowed to come back. <laughs> but Joe Biden uh, lives in Delaware next to their parents. And uh, they would, Biden would, they come, Biden would drop by once in a while through one of these parties. Uh, apparently, of course, I miss out on like my mother-in-law's like prime uh, entertaining years. But that's okay. When she used to make like fresh ch chutney from scratch. But they got Biden involved, and Biden used his power, his political influence, and, and got my uh, my lovely uh, wife, got the uh, her travel ban lifted. And now we got three beautiful kids and uh, beautiful dreams to shoot for. So thank you, Joe Biden, for doing that. Nonetheless, I'm still going to make fun of you here. So here we go, because this is called Funnier Than Weird Al, and you're not paying my bills. So, and neither is Jack's boss. Here you go. So I was talking about Joe Biden. And then also, for the record, Joe Biden, uh, anyone's aware of his history. I mean, this is a Doodle Daddy podcast. It is about parenting and uh, making our kids great again. And, you know, one of his kids, you know, uh, obviously, you know, died, and that's awful. But uh, the other one is had trouble with uh, with cocaine and drugs. You know, nothing new, you know, for, for people of privilege. Uh, my younger brother has had his own issues. I've, you know, made comments about it before. And even to this day, you know, he'll claim he's done with the nose candy, but for the most part, he still only hears last call from the bathroom stall. For the most part, he's been semi-functioning, uh, you know, perpetual fan of the nose candy. That's, that's a nice way of putting it. So the, the point being is that after Joe Biden's son died, he, his other remaining son made a move. And from what I... I'm pretty sure got involved with the widow of Joe Biden's son that died. So that's uh, I don't know what sort of morality classes they were teaching there over the uh, the Biden estate, but the uh, that's not kosher in my household. Uh, last time I checked, I even phrased that question to my children. I said like, "Does that seem right to you?" After like phrasing the situation, but I was like, "No, Daddy, that's awful." Uh, can we talk about uh, Lake George and miniature golf again? Because uh, you. Talk to me too often, like um, twenty, and I'm still only seven. So let's uh, let's chill out of them exposing me to uh, Michael Savage podcasts and uh, crank up that uh, poison. Nothing but a good time. Okay, that'd be nice. So I was talking about Joe Biden. So Joe Biden was trending on Twitter, and last time I checked, Biden was largely responsible for making sure that our high schools became gun-free zones banning teachers from packing. I wonder why they don't have school shootings in Israel. Ted Nugent for Secretary of Defense, bitches! <laughs> I love Ted Nugent. He comes across very lucid. He's super articulate. He's a true, like, nature, like, conservationist. You know, gives back. You know, I love elk. Huge fan of elk. I had, when I was in Lake George, I had some uh, spicy uh, elk uh, jerky. It was phenomenal. I was 
huge fan of elk. He gives it to soup kitchens. So, are, are you hunting for elk and you give me back the soup kitchens? I'm not. So, that makes Ted Nugent um, better than me. And you got to respect, admire, and promote the rock stars that didn't let drugs ruin their careers, who have you know raised children, who've been brutally honest about the, the casualties and the burnouts and the Sid Barrett's of the world. And for someone that was, and basically nailed the message home saying, listen, like you don't need drugs to become a great artist, right? There's a, a natural high called audience <laughs> screaming or audience laughter in your honor and the magic from live performance in general. So uh, God bless Ted Nugent. He was good friend. He became friends with Anthony Bourdain towards the end too. So you can tell me you had better judgment than Bourdain. So I'll stop talking about. Uh, and my wife does love that song "Stranglehold" by uh, Ted Nugent. And for a guy that never smoked any weed or did any acid, that song "Stranglehold" sounds pretty psychedelic. Last time I checked. So, but that's enough about uh, Ted Nugent for now. Can I file for a collusion grievance? <laughs> After upper management and Robert Half colluded to fire me for my developing fro of a beard, <laughs> after failing to hit anything close to resembling all star numbers, <laughs> uh, this is the joke that I forgot to open up my, my podcast with because I got uh, dis distracted from trying to like close my door after my son had the perfect intro but just but failed to close the door. But I forgot to give him that instruction. It's not the end of the world. But this is me. Uh, so last night, just a little backstory. Uh, decided I had a previous episode called Homer's Dunks and TKOs, and I never took any like self defense martial art courses. I truly believe that I wouldn't be in a position where I would have allowed certain people to push me around uh, as much as I have in my life if I had taken martial arts and developed that confidence from it. So as a result, I'm gonna make sure my kid that doesn't happen to my kids, because that's what do what all dads do. We want to make sure our kids don't suffer as much as we did, and we want to empower them sooner than later, so they get addicted to winning. Uh, sooner than later and our goal over here folks is do it all dads is to keep our kids uh, free from uh, drugs get involved in sports they can be strong with spirit soul and mind and they could be uh, kick-ass uh, entrepreneurs perform entertainer extraordinaires and not even have to go to college and instead say hey daddy you know that 80 grand you're gonna spend to send me to Tulane so I can get my uh, my liver uh, dislodged uh, during freshman orientation. How about you give that for stutter money, for my you know graphic novel uh, business? Sure. Why not? The um, and if I failed, then I I saw, then at least I went for it, and uh, it's obviously an incredible belief in me. I'll make new friends. I'll learn from uh, the experience, and it'll make a great story, and. And we'll leave to something else because what I always tell my kids, you know, you just got to do one thing leads to another. You know, I started writing spec scripts in Los Angeles. I was like 24. Why did I start writing them? My girlfriend, Erica, uh, God bless her. She saw something in me and I didn't really see much of a creative spark. I knew I was semi-funny. I talked about writing screenplays, but I wasn't doing anything about it. And again, that's a theme I was talking about with my kids today. We are on and about. I said, you know, there, there's talkers and there's doers. But, you know, and doer, doing in general leads to things happening in your life in some positive manner. And if I don't start writing TV spec scripts with Erica, I don't have a conversation, I don't reach out to an alumni from Ithaca where I went to college, otherwise known as Cornell's retarded next door neighbor. But I was in the school of communication, so I could pop some extra strong ganja at $78 an eighth and not manage to stutter every other two seconds. So if I don't meet Erica in Los Angeles from working as an IT headhunter, cold calling my brains out, if I don't stick with that when I got hung up on all the time, for more bridges than Godzilla, uh, it was total bull in a china shop, but I stuck with it. By my seventh month, build almost 100K. Beautiful moment. And then it was great when I worked for Remington. I have to do a deal. Everyone in the office would yell. Well, you yell after you do a deal. It's official. As you know, that the offer's been accepted by the candidate. And you already know what the offer was extended by uh, HR, the hiring manager. So once you got the candidate closed, 
you yell out, Deal! And then everyone stops, whatever they're doing, and they all give you a high five. And that was a beautiful moment. So God bless you, Michael Burns and Alex Zubavoy, for sticking with me and for giving me uh, that moment because that was a real heavy metal high, man-building moment, and it provided incredible momentum. You know, I and obviously kept, kept me employed before I went on that tear that month where I did not stop, where I did stop smoking guys and almost build 100K. Obviously, it was towards the tail end dot com boom, so that helped. But I, I was embodied extreme confidence, and I did not hesitate. By the way, if you look up hesitation in the dictionary, yeah, I look at lots of words now. I teach my kids. Hesitate means slow of speech or action. So what I always tell my kids is, like for example, if you're playing basketball, shoot it with confidence. Throw your entire body into it. Whether there be a punch, a driver. You don't want to break things down in certain components. More momentum, bigger follow through, the better. So if I'm not working at Remington, and if I'm not cold calling my brains out 3,000 3, miles away from home, if I'm not sticking with that, I don't go to this bar that we used to go to in Westwood. I don't meet Erica. She doesn't hit on me. The uh, I don't know why I mentioned that, but I just did. And by the way, you ever notice like some girls just don't taste as good as others? <laughs> I really wish Erica tasted better. I don't believe I'm saying this. God, please forgive me. Erica, you tasted good. I think you had like falafel that night. We'll leave it at that before Kim Chi went mainstream. So, uh, and when she was, we did have some nice kissing sessions. So I, I can't say that a girl that I dated that I was pseudo in love with uh, ever tasted bad. So very sorry for saying that. Completely strike it from the record. Your Lord, Erica, if you're listening, I have no idea if you are. But again, Erica, Cannot thank you enough for pushing me down the creative writing path because when I was cold calling, as much as I was, and I was spending all my time sourcing, what's sourcing? It's you know organizing leads, everything. You did say, listen. I just hate the fact that you have to spend all your time doing this when I know you could be spending some creating. Now you could say that I took that advice to the extreme and say to my detriment to a certain degree, but if without that nudge, I don't get my TV writing break in Manhattan. That was twelve years in the making. And I'm not introduced by uh, my boss producer, Jay Moran, saying this is the writer that I hire for America's Hard 100. And being introduced as a writer, I to feel like a schmuck in a headset for so long. It's been just ordinary. Because I was never like the true rainmaker. My father was a rainmaker. He worked in like packaging sales. He made lots of money. You know, probably typical year, like 250 and change. It's a lot. He was VP. You know, managing like 90 million in sales. He was a rainmaker. I was more of a trickler. <laughs> so... It felt great 12 years after Erica gave me this nudge. You know, I call these people guiding stars that I believe God puts in our life to put us in uncertain uh, life paths. So I'm grateful, Erica, for that role that you you played in my life. I, I truly am. And I'm sorry for breaking your heart. It wasn't my intention. But I don't know. I can't believe I keep on bringing up Erica. But the so with Erica... She pushed me to start writing these TV spec scripts. We started writing spec scripts for Curb Your Enthusiasm. She worked for a literary agency called Kaplan Thaler. They represented David Angel, who was the head writer of Frasier. He actually died during 9-11. And so we were able to get early feedback. Uh, and actually, the feedback was that my writing was more dramatic and not as funny. But I became obsessed with the funny. And the point being, when I talk about one thing leading to another, is that you know when I became obsessed all of a sudden, when I had this like new dream to latch onto, to break free from like the drudgery of being this you know cold calling schmuck in a headset, which I felt despite some like limited success, in you know, a brutalized the comedy uh, post 9/11 and Y2K in Southern California, that I ended up reaching out to this guy who went to Ithaca and he wrote Everyone Loves Raymond, and I said I want to write for TV. What do you recommend? And he goes start doing stand up. So that's that's how I started doing stand up. And when you do stand up, you know, you never forget that first year when you get goonish on stage and you don't get any laughs. And that, so you could say that I've really been obsessed with, you could say that the true definition of like failing is like quitting. And that's why I, I can't just not conquer the stand up stage the way that I know I can. It's the reason why I've been stockpiling material like Rodney here, I'm used to doing duffel bags when it's so aluminum siding. You know, when Rain was why I started this podcast was to repurpose my jokes that were sort of getting shadow banned on Twitter. And so 
but one thing led to another. And that, that's my point here, folks, that we should constantly emphasize to our children because, you know, I reach out to this guy. He goes, do stand-up. And then I do stand-up and I suck. But, you know, meanwhile, you know, when I... But I was going to stand up to become a better writer. And when I met my future wife at the time, um, Barry Diller's balcony, I worked in Central Park. I was doing ad sales for City Search. Almost didn't make it into that party. I was working on a family guy script. Prior to that, I met a girl, a Filipino. She goes, what would make you happy? I go, I got to write a family guy script or I'm going to feel like a complete hack. So I had something semi-interesting to share with my with Natalia at the time, who was like a, what, 24-year-old uh, executive assistant for IAC at the time. Uh, and so one thing led to another. And then after that, I kept on writing. Uh, I went from, you know, to, from job to job. I had some more headhunting jobs and, and then I got fired from Segula. I wrote my 30 rock. I had used commission money from JP Morgan hedge fund services. So my mom was actually able to be, uh, very helpful in this instance and was not judgy at all. I asked her for orchard info for JP Morgan hedge fund services. I got it. Ended up doing a deal. Got like seven grand commission check, and that was beautiful. Uh, I was getting that, and I had unemployment. Threw myself in the writing, wrote my third rock, placed third in a national TV writing contest. Thank you, Larry Brody. Became a TV recommended writer, and I no longer felt like a poser, you know, uh, in in Park Slope. So I felt like I was being surrounded by all these working artist types. I don't know how many were. I also questioned how much money there was in freelance photography, but. You know, there were times where I definitely bombed there, and there's other time where I went back to this place called Bar Four, had a great set, I had a good bucci, uh, bocce ball joke. I, I went after the the, uh, the hipsters hard, and it was a really good set, and it was a really big room. And afterwards, this hippie that I was talking before he goes, "You're my hero." So I want to be my kid's hero, and I want to be funnier than Weird Al. So let's get back to some jokes. <laughs> so I'm just not rambling here and uh, and telling you stories uh, off the top of my head. Uh, not that I can't be funny, rambling, telling stories, because true comedic clowns um, are have the capacity to be bo- to be great at both. So there's an actual Rolling Stone headline that I read this week while doing research on the best death albums of all time. But this is an actual Rolling Stone headline that I read. Here we go. Trump attacks on the media are reaching dangerous new levels. Sure. The uh, fake news media is the naive, well-meaning one like Penny Lane and Almost Famous. <laughs> so I never got to this, the, the joke about my son. So my point is that uh, so there's this Shaolin uh, Kung Fu school right in my neighborhood in Crown Falls. So we signed up my daughter. And afterwards, I felt compelled to play my children some Wu Tang. Wu Tang. So far, they're familiar with Nas. Uh, I'm positive. When we lived in Queens, right outside of Queens Bridge, my daughter's first synchronized head bopping shimmy was to Nas, Ether. It wasn't Ether. It was Made You Luck. That was great. And then it was a Doobie Conqueror by Bob Marley soon after that. You never forget these things. So, and by the way, I just, I can't stand these hipsters that have been forced to move from like Brooklyn to Queens because they can no longer afford Brooklyn anymore. And all of a sudden, these like hipsters, you know, try to act like a pusher salesman Donald Trump type for Queens all of a sudden. Yeah, these hipsters are like, like I'll run into them when I'll do an occasional open mic in the city since my stay at home dad uh, apprentice uh, began. Father of three, by the way. And I love when these hipsters say, Queens is so hot. And I'll say, no, it's not. <laughs> Compared to Manhattan and Brooklyn, Queens is the sloppy third Kardashian sister. You know, the extra greasy one that's easy to pound at three in the morning, like a lamb gyro in Astoria. So back to Wu Tang, Wu Tang. So this is me freaking out my four-year-old son to Wu Tang, 36 Chambers. Hey, Arthur, you got quiet real fast. Did... The Wu Tang on the Alexa Echo speaker scare you a bit? And my son says, No, Dada. But if I saw nine of them on TV, I'd shit my pants. <laughs> See? Totally should have opened up with that. Consumer confidence is at an 18 year high. Hear that, Mom? <laughs> Let me repeat. 
Consumer confidence is at an 18-year high. Obama taking credit for this economic boom is like Nino Brown taking credit for getting Pookie off the base and welfare. They're coming back for the base. Mayor Van Peoples, great movie in New York City. I've been sampling that joke a lot lately, out and about. It's getting very big laughs because apparently uh, New Jack City has been playing in constant rotation lately. I think on Stars or Cinemax or something. So that's always nice when that happens. Usually my references are, uh, are more dated than Yiddish. So uh, Trump may regulate Google. Good. My Tumblr porn searches on it are getting more repetitive than my resolutions to try my hand at using my imagination again. <laughs> Trump may regulate Twitter. Because I wouldn't consider a loudmouth, stay-at-home comedian slash father of three who pushed and got his wife to agree for a freebie hooker bang in Germany once. He makes it as a headline of comedian as conservative. Huh. Trump may regulate Google. For what? Hiding my jokes on Chelsea Handler's feed? Chelsea Handler is no longer a talk show host on Netflix. Now she's a full-time social justice activist warrior. So we focus less on her tit-sagging popularity. Hey now. Eminem thinks uh, Trump is Hitler. And what? Inglorious Bastards too? Hey, someone fact shady. Make Nazi Germany great again wasn't his campaign slogan, dude. Eminem drops a surprise album. Not trafficking in obvious homophobic lyrics to disguise the jizzy backside of the gay hip-hop mafia would surprise me. When you take a detox from weed, Eminem sounds like Richie Rich, hyped on Adderall and mad whippets, yo. Merger talk with Dr. Dre and Eminem. Microsoft paid $26.2 billion for Microsoft. Word! LinkedIn is lamer than ever, yo. These are uh, Nick and Nick names for my kids. <laughs> my daughter, my call it my, my daughter Matilda and Shalada, Arthur Peckerwood, and uh, Samuel, the youngest of the bunch, Innie. <laughs> and uh, so we're going over these nicknames. My kids got to kick out these nicknames. Nicknames go a long way, folks. If you want to talk about controlling your kids with comedy, and you could even like use it against them too. Like for whenever my son acts like a pushy dictatorial uh, psychopath, I call him Little Hitler. That shuts him up real fast. He doesn't like to be called Hitler. <laughs> or if my daughter starts, you know, talking about you know being, or she starts like ordering her brother around and starts being pushy, I call her uh, Brook Breath, and she hates that because Brook Breath. Everyone knows a brook, and she has that brook in her school, and she hates her. <laughs> she, like, articulates a violent fantasy, revenge fantasies against her. So my daughter's referencing Spidey Bear, okay? Because we were just talking about, like, naked nicknames, and basically, like, pee-pee jokes. And this is what my daughter has to say about Spider Bear. She's only seven. <laughs> so she says, Spider Bear has a huge one. <laughs> he's a superhero bear, and he's got muscles on it. I've created a comedy monster, folks. This conversation with my mom... My uh, elitist mom. Remember when we did mini golf in Florida at Pirate Cove? And this is unemployed comedian slash father of three being me. It's not a competition, mom, but me doing it with my three kids in Lake George was better than dad showing no interest in me as usual. Blew it out of the water, really. It's my retired elitist mother again. A diving horse act sounds like animal cruelty. They weren't waterboarding it, mom. Plus, they didn't force the show horse lightning to wear Flash Gordon Speedos either. A diving horse act sounds like animal cruelty. Are you Carmelo Soprano now? A diving horse act sounds like animal cruelty. No, Mom. Animal cruelty is your seven-year-old daughter telling her dad he dies like a girl. Despite giving it props a sack earlier. Penny the Arcade got shot down from TD Bank because some snot-nosed punk accused Penny of shortchanging her at the bank. But time is money, and rolling up a sleeve of nickels... Back in the day, it took longer than getting a straight answer on AIDS. Ronan Farrow says NBC told him to stop reporting on the Harvey hair clumps, Weinstein rape stories. The bright side to the story is that Harvey's wife decided to finally divorce the fat pig to focus 
on her lifetime battles with amnesia. Great joke, I know. It's my mom. We plan on posting your pics from Lake George on Facebook. My wannabe reply. Is that what you're saving your emotive love for? Because your text reaction to them sucked. Stephen Hawkins in the grave expresses more expansiveness than you do. Why am I jealous of Neil Young marrying Daryl Hannah? What, only rock royalty get to go through a midlife never banged a mermaid crisis? <laughs> My younger brother works for Shake Shack. Too bad In-N-Out makes better burgers. And their superiority teases Shake Shack knockoff. Cheeseburger, cheeseburger, cheeseburger. Creations from afar. USA, USA. Should big tech be regulated? My podcast isn't looking for any handouts, but an unbiased podcast jury wouldn't hurt either. Blasting Hillary Hammer Time Cankles and Obama hasn't boosted my popularity in Cupertino. That's for damn sure. Should Big Tech be regulated? For Diamond and Silk being tagged unsafe to the Facebook community by Zitfei Zuck? Yes. Nino Brown was unsafe to the community. Diamond and Silk are De La Soul in comparison. Should Big Tech be regulated? Facebook should monitor Zitfei Zuck's water bottle intake at the next company retreat rave in downtown Berlin. You can actually overdose on too much water on XC. Forget about it. Should big tech be regulated? If fake news continues to get away with comparing Antifa to a bunch of scrubs who got cut from the Harlem Globetrotters and not the Washington Generals. <laughs> Could be the best of the bunch. Should big tech be regulated? I am getting pretty pissed off at starting a new Twitter account every time I get into a joke zone and get shadow banned up, up the wazoo again. Should big tech be regulated? I do miss Alex Jones' blog post on bunker hideout tips to avoid headhunters still harassing you far into adulthood since his lifetime ban on LinkedIn. <laughs> so again, folks, this is episode 42. Be funnier than Weird Al. And... What I've decided to do, so something to look forward to. We're going to be, once my kids start, uh, once my son, Art Show USA, who did that amazing intro, he's going to start his uh, pre-K. He's got one year before kindergarten. He's going to be starting that next week. Dar's going to be starting uh, second grade. And I'll have plenty of time with my uh, third latest and greatest, uh, Samuel Teddy Cornbluth. And he will be my co-host for a do-it-all dad lunchtime cooking show called Double Talk with Chef Samuels. We're always a big hit whenever I'm out doing jokes, hurling my baby around like he's my remote air guitar pendant. So I figure, why not do a show based on the two of us because we definitely cause a stir where we go. Him more so than me, but we make a great team. And I think that, as they say in the LinkedIn universe, this show could provide plenty of added value that's out there, offering delicious, healthy, Easy, do it all dad, lunch, recipe, performance, videos for do it all dads who want to make our kids great again. And obviously they'll be funny and entertaining and we'll be keeping the spirit of the late great Anthony Bourdain alive. And, you know, also a lot of people don't know this, uh, you know, also Weird Al Yankovic, another guy, never did drugs, he's a great role model. And he's written a couple of children books that, that was actually my introduction before I showed like the fat video. And I plan on being a successful children author myself. I got my own ideas and I'm gonna start banging out a, a short story a week in the past. You know, the idea was to write all these TV spec scripts and write pilots, which I did. I was able to impress certain people on the way, like the Nick DePaulo's of the world and Margaret Cho from, uh, from, from purely original uh, pilot material. I already mentioned the 30 Rock thing, but, and I'm not trying to call all of Hollywood rape wood, okay? But, uh, it's definitely a bad look knowing that Miramax, you know, winning all these awards, and I just find it hard to believe that people didn't know what Harvey Weinstein was up to, and and the Corey Haim thing still kills me. So, and I'm back here in New York, you know, I've, I know I've talked about, you know, moving to Pennsylvania and this and that, and uh, you know, I truly believe, you know, God hooked us up with this house for a reason, and but that's another episode that I'll get into, but um, I'm very grateful for it. Long story short, my wife applied for a housing grant. We got it. I call it my comedy grant. So eventually there will be an episode called uh, My Comedy Grant, and it will be about this house. But I don't want to take attention away 
from my son, Arthur Morrison Kornbluff, who has really been the biggest beneficiary so far of this time here, because uh, it's been two years, bud, uh, since we left Pleasantville. We were renting there, and he's going up so fast, and for him to do that intro, we didn't really rehearse very long at all, folks, and uh, he, he he's so loving to his sister, but he's also like a boy, and you know, whenever I say ladies first, he's like, no, boys first. <laughs> so not willing to concede to, uh, you know, girl power all the time on question 24-7. So it's a man after my own heart. Um, I love when my, my, my own dad busts my balls. Like, dad, you, he's like, he's, he just says to me, you have no leverage with your wife. I go, of course I do. Am I making money right now? No. But if push came to shove, um, I, and if my wife didn't want to divorce me, I'd say, just like Brad Pitt and Angelina, uh, the kids would want to live with dad. <laughs> so I got that leverage working for me. And then uh, my also my retort line is that, that the kids would never forgive mommy. <laughs> Obviously, they love mommy. But I've been able to spend uh, more time with my kids. And it inspired me to start this podcast. And I, I feel that I've got some words of wisdom to, show, uh, to share out there. Oh, by the way, something to look forward to. You know, I do need to uh, advertise this podcast. And by the way, I did exceed the 1,000 download mark. So thank you, everyone, for listening listening to episodes. Uh, I appreciate it from the bottom of my heart. Just read the New York Post. Talk about primo source material that came from unexpected places. FEO Schwartz is now hiring four new employees at their new headquarters in Rockefeller Center. They're holding auditions. <laughs> Uh, not interviews, and looking for someone who's got a sense of theater. So, Miss Farney, my Matilda's first grade teacher, who said I should be hosting my own TV show, I think it's going to be great material, and you got to start somewhere. And obviously, we'll be doing the uh, Double Talk with Chef Samuels. we got some new comics at the Food Network we're going to be uh, sharing that with. And I'm very excited. So, that's a pretty cool thing. Tell you, kid, you work for FAO Schwartz. Uh, my, my new title on LinkedIn will be uh, Sales Toy Entertainer. <laughs> Something to that effect. But uh, I'm excited to uh, get back in the city. And again, you know, I talk about, I guess, this theme where I talk about one thing leading to another. And we had Matilda. She was not planned. I got my TV writing break, Adventure VH1. And I was able to pitch my pilot. I thought we made it in the shade. That was not the case. And the, uh, this is how my son was born. True story. Dad's visiting from Arizona. And he says, don't have another son or don't have another child if you think about it because I don't want to have to support one. So don't worry about it, Pops. <laughs> uh, it's a non-issue. We never ask for your help. And literally that night, it was my birthday, I, uh, I pulverized my wife's vagina and uh, impregnated her with uh, my future son, Arthur Morrison Cornbill. So my son was truly born in the spirit of F you. Parental Rebellion. And the bigger topic here for the Do It All Dad Year podcast for being funny in the Weird Al, Dada, is this. The best thing about fatherhood, by far, is earning the faith and trust in your children and being blessed with the opportunity to over-deliver on their faith and hope in you. And I plan on doing it for all of you. Archo USA, Samuel Teddy, and Matilda Rose Cornbluth. Uh, like they say in common, the best things happen in threes, and it certainly applies to fatherhood and for the uh, revised dreams that you've given me uh, to shoot for and make a reality so we could extend this wonderful, great time together and have my legacy be you guys being a part of this entertainment franchise and you having that freedom to be uh, truly charitable because. It's hard to be charitable when you're so broke. Your Hebrew name is under judicial review. <laughs> so this is uh, Michael Kornbluth, host of the Do It All Dad Your Podcast. Dad-friendly entertainment for you and me. Controlling our kids through comedy. Can make our kids great again. And I'll talk to you guys soon.